Today's the day. Radeon 7600 is launching, and also the Pulse 7600. But it's coming in at $269, less than $300. This is less than the suggested end user pricing for the 6600 when it launched. I thought runaway hyperinflation was going to kill us all. How is AMD able to do this? And more importantly, how is Sapphire able to do this with their version of the card? <laughs> It's launch day. There's a lot to unpack here. We have to dive in. 269, that can't be right. 269 suggested end user pricing. Street pricing, probably gonna be a little bit more, but hey, this is the perfect card for a small form factor build. Let's dive in. All right, so for this review, we're gonna be taking a look at the 7600. How does it perform? What do we got going on? It's already an A3. It's eight gigabytes of VRAM. How fast is it? Does it work? Can you actually buy it for $300? Is it worth buying for $300? What's the upgrade path? How are you gonna do this? Yes, we will get to all of that. It's so little. <laughs> okay, AIB partner versions aren't gonna be little, but look at this packaging. The AMD.com packaging, mmm, so nice. It's a dual fan, slightly less than two slots. It's a little bit shorter than two slots. You got three DisplayPort outputs and one HDMI. Most, but not all of the AIB partner DisplayPort outputs are gonna be 2.1. That's something to look at if you're looking for that. Some AIB partner models, they said, are going to be DisplayPort 1.4, it just depends. We've got a single eight pin power connector. While I'm going to cover the Sapphire Pulse version more fully in a separate video, be on the lookout for that. This is an ideal GPU for small form factor systems. Look at this. I mean, the PCB really is this big and it's tiny and a lot of fun. And when we think tiny and powerhouse, we think as rock desk me. You know, the bare bone, bones version of this is only like $250. We're gonna put this in there to start. Now, it turns out it's a little bit of a challenge to insert this in there. We've got our GPU mounted in our tiny little computer. Look, I've even got the Intel reference cooler on this thing. What more do you want? Now for our testing in the desk meet, it's an i7-12700. No K, there's not even a K. The desk meet does let the CPU run a little bit outside power spec, but that's fine. And our other test system is based around the Ryzen 7700X. Why don't we use the highest end CPUs available? Well, because if you're buying this GPU, you're probably not pairing it with a $500 CPU. Am I right? Mm, yeah, probably. I'm also interesting to test it actually in the desk meet, which I would consider to be real world power and thermals. Definitely thermals. Using this GPU for a pretty intense session of uh, Callisto protocol actually in the desk mini revealed some interesting things. First, air FLIR footage. As you can see, the exhaust from this thing, 47 degrees C. It was pretty toasty. Our desk meat uh, works pretty well to draw air in from the top and exhaust the hot air out the side. That said, you can hear the fans ramp on this. Our Run Info 64 reports up to 2300 RPM fans for this. I usually don't bring up this kind of thing unless I can hear it, it's audible, you know, desktop configuration. It's important to remember the small form factor case makes it pretty easy to hear whatever you're working with in terms of graphics card or noise or fan or whatever. Cause you can hear the CPU fan ramp when that's a problem. You can hear the GPU fan ramp when that's a problem. This wasn't annoyingly loud. It's just, you could hear it. GPU power, as reported by Hardware Info 64, was 156 watts burst, 130 watts sustained. On our kilowatt meter for total power draw at the wall while gaming, we were well under 250 watts most of the time. Occasionally it would spike up to 300 watts, give or take, but again, keep in mind that's total system power. And that power draw is well below our rated power supply in the desk meet. So this is a pretty impressive result overall. The most negative aspect, of course, is the thermals. This little box is sitting on your heat, generating 200, 300 watts of heat while you're gaming. I mean, that's pretty good considering gaming PCs and some higher tier GPUs will use even more power than that. So if you're in a power constrained situation, you got a cabin in the woods running off solar, this is actually pretty efficient considering that it's only 300 watts. 
But it's also a little concerning that our memory hotspot and our GPU hotspots are in the 100 to 103C temperature range. Now I reached out to AMD and I said, hey, is this normal? And they said, nah, yeah, basically. If that bugs you, don't forget about Sapphire. <laughs> it's a bigger card. This card won't physically fit in a case like the desk meet, but our Sapphire RX 7600 is not only cooler, it's also significantly quieter. So be sure to check that out. Although spoiler alert, the performance is roughly the same, although it reports that it can use a few more Watts than our reference model, but hey, who's counting? 65 FPS at 1440p enable FSR2. You don't have to spend a lot of money to enjoy 1440p on some titles. Yeah, this is not the card for 1440p, strictly speaking, but you can still get a lot of mileage out of it. I was surprised it worked as well as it did without FSR2 1440p in brand new AAA titles like the Callisto Protocol. And I bring up Callisto Protocol first because it was the hardest one on the GPU in the quick test suite that we did. Other games, maybe not as much of a challenge. 93 FPS average in the Callisto Protocol, pretty darn good for 1080p. Now that is at 1080p resolution, but all of our other games could manage over 100 FPS. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 160 FPS with 120 FPS 1% lows. Borderlands 3 on Ultra, 117 FPS with 96 FPS for our 1% lows. Even Horizon Zero Dawn, 121 FPS. Goodness me, that's just madness. This GPU did so well at 1080p, we decided to try 1440p because maybe you've got a phantom gaming monitor like this one, you're moving up from 1080p gaming to 2560 by 1440p gaming. Let me tell you, that is really nice to be able to do that and enjoy 1440p, 2560 by 1440p gaming. Or maybe you wanna, you know, do a wide 1080p monitor. Those are out there, they're still kind of a thing. Well, it does pretty good with 1440p as well. Generally stays above 60 FPS, 90 FPS in some titles. So your AAA titles, if you're willing to live with medium or medium high settings, you can probably stay well above 60 FPS for those 1440p titles. Of course, High refresh rate monitors are becoming all the rage. 60, 90, 144 FPS for the actual panel refresh. Especially if you're rocking something even higher end like OLED, although if you're buying OLED, you're probably buying a more expensive graphics card. It's nice to be able to run all of those things at 90 Hertz and beyond. So really the 7600 is your 1080p gaming card for that. But if you've got an eye toward something even higher end, know that you can also do some 1440p gaming. In terms of the competitive landscape here, it's, it's pretty weird. We did the comparison with the 3060, which of course the 7600 uh, trounces. I mean, it's no contest. You shouldn't, the 3060, no, no. 7600 is a better deal pretty much across the board. So what's the verdict? Well, the 7600 reference edition can do things that pretty much no other 7600 can do, albeit at a little bit of a temperature penalty. The Pulse 7600 performs a little better and has better cooling and the hot spots are nowhere near as hot. Okay, cool, but what about the landscape of GPUs? This GPU got a pricing update just before launch, 269, or 269 is the suggested end user pricing. Now the Sapphire Pulse is gonna cost a little more than that, that's no problem because, well, you see, it's better cooling, physically bigger card. Sapphire's added some of their special sauce to it, and that is worth something. That is, Sapphire's built their brand and their reputation on quality construction and everything else. The problem here is the larger landscape. NVIDIA just launched the 4060 Ti, and we know from NVIDIA's own benchmarks that the 4060 Ti is going to slot in at roughly where the 3070 was in, in most benchmarks. The memory geometry is going to be a little bit of a penalty for the uh, 30 or for the 4060 Ti versus the 3070 when we're talking about like 1440p resolutions, but the 4060 Ti could pull ahead. The problem is that those cards are basically neck and neck, and the 3070 is a two-year-old card at this point, and the pricing hasn't really changed. 4060 Ti is coming in at the same price for basically the same performance. Let's call it the same performance. These cards aren't that. 269 is actually cheaper than the when the 6600 launched. Uh, quite a bit cheaper. And also the dollar is worth less now than it was, so it's even cheaper. 
to pull out the win with the 7600 AMD also had, you know, it's already an A3. There's all those improvements and that sort of thing. But it seems like that wasn't enough of an improvement for AMD. They also increased the total board power a little bit with the 7600. And that's probably to do with the junction temperatures and, you know, it's probably related to that. And it's probably because AMD is uh, super focused on the competitive landscape here. Listen, NVIDIA is basically checked out. Check out our 4070 review. We, we basically sum it up. NVIDIA is getting to a point where they're relying on frame generation technologies like DLSS3 to convince you that their cards are the better value, not that the card is actually doing the work in hardware. The software thing is something that will benefit everybody, and sure, maybe in some parallel universe, that is a thing. I mean, vote with your wallet and all that kind of stuff. But for the raw performance of the card, in terms of what the card is able to do, uh, NVIDIA is just not, they're, they're not electing to really compete. The pricing is not good on the 4060 Ti, to put it bluntly. It was not great on the 4070. The 4070 is still probably the better value overall if you have to go Team Green and the 4090, even with the insane pricing is, you know, the highest tier card. Whatever, okay, that's fine. But I think also a lot of reviews are gonna miss Intel. Intel's GPUs are coming in also around that $300 mark, a little more, like 330, 340, somewhere through there for a 16 gigabyte card. And that's really the threat here. Eight gigabytes of VRAM is getting to be not enough. It's enough today, but six months from now or a year from now, eight gigabytes is gonna be a little limiting. It's gonna be like maybe the four gigabyte cards of yesteryear. But the problem on the Intel side is you don't necessarily always get the raw performance or consistent performance across all titles. Don't worry, Intel will catch up. And I think AMD sort of knows that. So the out the gate pricing with the 7600, these are priced to move. And for a 1080p card for a system like this, they're, they're basically good to move. For 1080p gaming, this is a very competent card. It is an excellent value, I think, at 269, 279, something like that, in this landscape of cards. And also being RDNA 3, you know, latest and greatest. AAA titles are gonna run great. Our own performance testing shows that it runs great. Everything is pretty awesome. Now check out our Linux review because our Linux review is really awesome with the Pulse 7600. This is plug and play in Linux, if I had to sum up that review in basically one word. AMD still has the superior Linux experience and this card doesn't even require that you do anything exotic in terms of firmware. This is an, an excellent, excellent option, but watch that review for, for more info. Macroeconomic conditions notwithstanding, I'm sure that AMD would love to be able to charge more for their GPU, but if they feel good charging the 270 to 300-ish to dollar range, then I think this is pretty good for gamers. Yes, it would be nice to have more VRAM. Yes, it would be nice to have something a little bit higher end, but generation over generation, the improvements here are, AMD's doing better than NVIDIA. They're improving more gen on gen than NVIDIA is, which means that there will be a crossover point at some point in the not too distant future where AMD's got the performance leadership because moving from the 4060 Ti to the, and I say that to be a little bit inflammatory because the 4060 Ti really should be a 20% faster card. The 4070 should have been the 4060. The 4060 Ti should have been the 4050 Ti. 1050 Ti, remember that? That card was okay-ish. I don't know, that's enough rambling. I'm Wendell's Level 1, I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums.